Welcome to Creekwood United Methodist Church, where we are growing deep roots to share God's love. We are so excited to be with you in worship today here in person. Welcome to Creekwood United Methodist Church Online. We are so grateful that you've decided to worship with us virtually today. Thank you for joining us as we grow deep roots to share God's love. Here at Creekwood, we want to do everything we can to help you stay connected. Here are a few reminders for worshiping online. If you can, create yourself a sacred space as we worship together. Light a candle, open a Bible, just like we do in the sanctuary. When we stand together to sing or recite a creed, stand with us if you can so we can all participate together. Don't forget to say hi in the comments section. Even if you watch the service later, it's always good to connect in that way. Be sure to sign in online using the link in the comments section or go to creekwoodumc.org slash register to let us know you're attending. While you're online, add any prayer requests you might have. When it comes time for the offering, you can go to creekwoodumc.org, give tab, and give online, either through a credit card or an ACH transaction. You can set this up as a recurring gift if you'd like. Hey kids, when it's children's time, make sure that you come up real close to your device so that we can participate together. And we would love for you to be a part of Sunday School, so make sure that you email me for the Zoom link that is every single Sunday at 945. If you have any questions or any problems during the service, feel free to comment in the Facebook feed or send us a direct message. We are here to facilitate the best online worship experience possible for you. wonderful prelude to start us off, Phyllis. We always appreciate you sharing your gifts with us on Sunday mornings. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Creekwood United Methodist Church, where we are growing deep roots to share God's love. 
Whether you're joining us here in person in the sanctuary or joining us online, we're glad that you've decided um, to make Creekwood the place where you are worshiping this morning on the second Sunday of Advent. We are continuing our sermon series called Coming Home, where we are talking about the best parts about coming home. And before we get going, I have um, just a reminder for all of us here in person and for those of you online, we need you to register your attendance um, so that we can keep up with you, so that we can keep your information updated. So if you're here in person, um, there's a QR code in the back of the chairs that you can scan with your phone, or you can always um, just go to creekwoodumc.org slash register to do that. If you're online, that link should be posted in the comments. I believe it's the longer version that will lead you to the attendance form. Um, be, feel free to take time to do that now or maybe during the offering if you're not one of the singers. Um, but we really would like to keep up with you and keep up with what's going on um, through that form that has prayer requests for us. It also has any um, online ministry needs kind of to indicate that. So as we kind of look forward to 2021 and what we'd like to do in person and online, that's a great space um, for you to give us your ideas so we can take them and we can run with them. Um, for those of you here in person, again, if you'll register your attendance either now or later, we really appreciate that. Since we don't have the sign-in, we don't have you down quite yet. Um, the last thing I'll tell you is um, today, um, I hope that we can find the space to, to relax and to take a deep breath. And to just be with each other and be with our Creator. The folks online always do such a good job of, of greeting one another in the comments. And so for those of you here in person, I invite you to take just a second and turn to the person on your right and your left and in front of you and behind you. Just give a little wave so you can keep your distance. Smile with your eyes. Make sure they know you're not frowning at them underneath your mask. Wouldn't be very welcome. Like I said, today is the second Sunday of Advent. And so now we'll watch a video of the lighting of our Advent candles for today. Today we light the first and second Advent candles. Candle today we light the, the, the fourth and the second Advent candles. And the candle of hope and the candle of peace. In Luke, when Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem, though there was no room, they were still cared for. May we like, may we like the end people make room for all people in this place that there might be peace. Let us pray. Loving God, as we continue this Advent season, we open our hearts to those looking for a place. Show us the power of peace. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you that we may be filled with the light of Christ. Amen. dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Time now for children's time with Allison. How's everybody today? Good. If you are joining us virtually, I'm so glad to see you. It is a happy, happy Sunday. Maybe the sun will come out. I don't know, we got a lot of gray happening today, but that's okay, it makes it feel wintry, so. All right, well, let's get started. So every once in a while, I get a thing called a wild hair. <laughs> and some of the kids are probably like, what in the world does that mean? But I'm sure all of you know. Now, my wild hair is a little, um, not too crazy, but what a wild hair is is like, wanting to do something that's like, something that you don't usually do, and it's kind of crazy. And so I brought some of my wild hairs with me today. This is actually very true. These are cookbooks. They're cookbooks, and every once in a while, I will sit down, maybe just like twice a year, I'll sit down and I'll thumb through these different pictures and I'll look at all the yummy stuff that's in here, and um, then I'll like eventually find what looks like the perfect recipe. And I think, I can totally do this. Butter, sugar, oil, eggs, no problem. I can totally handle this. So um, I get to it. And then about halfway through, I'm reminded that this is not a good idea. Miss Allison is, I just am not good at cooking. I'm not good at baking. It was a really hard lesson when I understood for the first time that there was a difference between vegetable oil and olive oil when baking a cake. Not good. And if it calls for baking soda or baking powder, you better use baking soda or both baking powder because it is a for sure necessary ingredient even though it's like half a teaspoon. So <laughs> it's very, very important. But here is the good news, is that I can go to my mom's house anytime I want and go to my parents' house. My mom is the, the, the baker, the cook of the house. My dad just enjoys it all, right? So my mom makes the best chocolate cake and we have a name for it. It was found in um, some magazine long, long time ago. It's called Old Ladies Home Chocolate Cake and it is out of this world. And I've tried to make it and it is, just did not turn out very good. So anyway, but it is my absolute favorite and it just feels so good to know that I can go home and eat that yummy chocolate cake or whatever it is that mom has cooked up for that, that week or that, you know, that get together. So it makes me wonder, did Joseph and Mary, when they had to travel back to Joseph's hometown, was he thinking about chocolate cake? 
Was he thinking, I wonder who is going to make me my yummy, yummy favorite whatever it was? I doubt it. I really, really doubt it. I think he had a lot more on his mind, and that is that it was Mary, and she was so pregnant. Yes? They had to go there because there was a census taking place, and Caesar Augustus ordered everybody to return to their hometown so that they could be counted and taxed, yes? And honestly, Caesar Augustus, he did not care that Mary was about to pop, that Mary was about to have this baby. So atop that donkey she went, and they made the long trip to Bethlehem. And when they arrived, there was no chocolate cake. In fact, there were like no open arms. There was no beautiful place for them to stay. No nice warm pillow for, their, for them to rest their heads on, upon. But um, God continued to provide. And God did provide them with a very, very, um, we'll just say place, a very good place uh, for them to be. And um, I'm sure that, that Joseph was just like very, very worried and just really desperate to find somewhere for Mary to get comfortable to have what was the most important baby of all time, baby Jesus, and a stable. That's what it was. That's what Joseph found. And they made the best of what they had. And they called it home for a short while. And Mary gave birth, like I said, to this most important baby. And she wrapped this new baby up in just simple, simple cloth and laid him in a manger. And God continued to provide for Mary and Joseph and this sweet baby. And they felt comforted and they felt warm and they had everything that they needed provided for them. And we understand that we also feel warmth and love when we are at home. But we also need to think about this beautiful place when we come to church, our church home. This is also a place where we feel comforted and um, warm, whether we're in person or if we're virtual. We are here together and we are a church family and this is a wonderful place to be, to remember uh, baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph and what it felt like that very first uh, few nights together. So let's bow our heads. Y'all pray with me. Dear God, thank you for loving and caring for us. Thank you for our families and homes. And thank you for our wonderful church. Amen. Y'all have a great day. Thank you for that reminder this morning, Miss Allison. Apparently, according to some of the comments online, um, Julie Jones wants that recipe. Um, so you're going to have to post that on Facebook later. Um, I will tell the short version of the story that I one time got um, teaspoon and tablespoon mixed up when making a cake. But it was not with the baking soda or the baking powder. It was with the cream of tartar. It was terrible, in case you want to know. Don't try that at home. Um, so as we continue in thinking about um, our favorite recipes and the things that taste like home, um, I want to invite us to a time of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Loving God, we thank you for this day, for the ability and the time and the space to gather for the online space to be present with one another. God, through this year in which we've probably spent more time at home than ever before, help us as we continue to remember the best parts about going home. And God, in a year in which we've probably spent the most time away from the church. Help us as we remember the best parts about coming here. We're coming to the people from this place in the online space. Help us as we continue to make this church a home for people. God, that we might be welcoming, we might be comforting, and that we might be loving. Teach us as we continue to open our arms to our community. 
provide a space that feels like a safe home. And God, for those this morning who maybe have found churches not to feel like home, we ask that Creekwood might be different. We ask that our hearts might be turned towards you and what it is we can do to bring about your kingdom here on earth. God, today we pray for those who are hurting, for those who feel lost, for those who are confused, for those who have questions, and for those who are grieving. God, may those who need it feel your comfort this morning in a special way. We thank you for the promise that you give us in sending your son and the way in which we remember him through Advent. We thank you for lighting candles, for manger scenes, and for the things that we do together as one people. So it's in your name, God, that we pray these words that your son taught us with one voice saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir, for sharing that wonderful, wonderful song with us this morning. We appreciate each of you um, coming and bringing your gifts to us. As we continue in worship together, friends, we're going to move to our time of offering. And so this is a great time for those of you who are here in person who have not registered your attendance when I gently mentioned it earlier. I'll gently mention it again. If you want to go to creekwoodumc.org slash register, um, leave me a funny note or a joke. I actually do look at them every Monday morning before we have our pastoral care meeting. Um, so please, please, please register your attendance um, if you don't know how to use the QR code in the back of the seats, I'm happy to show you how to do that after the service. Um, for those of you who are online who have yet to register your attendance, you can also um, do that as well if you go to creekwoodumc.org slash register. But as we continue um, and we move to our time of offering, um, we want you to know that um, this is a communion Sunday. Even though I said the Lord's Prayer earlier, I totally messed that up. So we won't say it later with communion, but it'll be fine. Um, it's Communion Sunday, which means that we have our hands and feet mission offering. Um, and this month, our mission offering is going to go towards the ACO angel tree that we are doing. It went by so fast to get rid of all of our angels. We are really, really excited um, about how well everybody responded to that. And just a reminder, um, for those of you who did ACO angel tree through the church, we have drop off for that this week. Um, so you can stop by the office uh, Monday through Thursday and say hi to any of us who are there and drop your gifts. Or if you're coming to the live nativity on Wednesday or Thursday night, we'll also have a room reserved for people to come down. And you can kind of kill two birds with one stone um, with that. So if you have any questions, feel free to find me after the service. If you're here in person or if you're online, you can always um, send me an email or even a Facebook message. And I'm happy to answer those questions for you. Um, friends, for those of you who are here in person during the music, if you'd like to come forward and leave your offering in the bowls. And then the mission offering, if you'll put on the outside, still on the table, that's how we'll know um, that that is to go towards the ACO Angel Tree donation that we're going to give. So let's pray over our tithes and offerings this morning. God, we thank you for the ways in which you have continued to be generous to us for the ways in which you have blessed us. God, help us as we return back to you a portion of what you have given to us. Help us to be generous, to be a blessing to others. God, may the gifts given here this morning in person and those given online today and later this week be used for your glory and for the advancement of your kingdom here on earth. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. When blossoms flowered mid the snows upon a winter's night, Born the child, the Christmas rose, the King of love and light. The angels sang, the shepherds sang, the grateful earth rejoiced, the grateful earth rejoiced, and at his blessed birth, the stars. 
make the argument that that's probably one of the most difficult Christmas songs, particularly to do a duet. So ladies, thank you so much for sharing your gifts with us this morning. Can we just give another hand to all of our musicians today? I feel like our musicians always bring it, but also around the holidays, there's like an extra level of bringing it that seems to happen at Creekwood. So thank you all um, for the ways in which you continue to bless us through music this morning. Our scripture for today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. This is verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration that was, to take pla that was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, the city of David, called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say, thanks be to God. Today we light the the fourth and the second advent candle, the candle of hope and.
almost wore the exact same outfit that was on the screen today, I just realized, as I was uh, getting dressed this morning. Um, Allison asked an interesting question uh, during her children's time. I think it's a good question to explore today is, what was Joseph expecting as he had to make that 80-mile trek to, uh, from, from Nazareth to home to Bethlehem, not necessarily knowing what to expect or where to stay? I assume he was going towards his ancestral home, but it tells us there's no room in the end, what was he expecting? What were the smells that he was expecting? Was it old lady chocolate cake or whatever the recipe was? Um, I will go to my grave believing that Mary and Joseph ate tamales and chili on Christmas Eve because it is the only God-ordained meal on Christmas Eve. If the Lesnar family is eating anything other than tamales and chili on Christmas Eve, um, call the police because we are being held hostage uh, somewhere. Um, I asked earlier, and this the Facebook comments, what's your favorite Christmas candy? Um, and you can comment along, or I'd love to hear some shout-outs. What, let, me, let me hear you answer this question. What tastes like home? What's the, the meal that you have, or the dish that you have, or the candy that's baked? Um, comment along. Let me hear your answers here in person. What tastes like home? What is the dish that makes you feel like you have arrived in your comfort zone, like you are being taken care of? What is it? Pot roast, chicken pot pie. I heard some of the, What else? Roast beef. Okay, we had dark chocolate peppermint bark was a popular one with the candy answer. I think some other things are probably rolling in for me. It's the tamales and chili, which is weird because it's not the only time during the year that I eat tamales. But it just tastes extraordinarily better on Christmas Eve. Maybe it's because it's a sacrament on that day. Maybe it's because I'm gathered around family, friends. It's not even the only food, though, right? The Amanda Fletcher, Julie Jones commented along of uh, dark chocolate peppermint bark, right? That's not something we eat all the time, because, and, but at Christmas time, it's prepared especially for that season. It's prepared especially for you, right? I know when my mom makes an apple pie, my mom doesn't eat apple pie. She makes it for my dad at Christmas time. I know when growing up, we would go to uh, wherever the Christmas party was being held that year, whether it was Midland or Corpus or Tyler or Fairview, wherever it w- was, my Aunt Judy was bringing shortbread cookies. My Aunt Judy didn't eat shortbread cookies, but she knew that the rest of the family ate shortbread cookies. There, there's something about food, and not just any food, because I can go to, uh, I can go at Rosa's, or I can go to Mikosina. I can get tamales anywhere. But you know, the tamales we used to get when it was still in business and when my grandparents lived in San Antonio were from a little tamale shop right around the corner from their house. Right? Every food at Christmas time, when we go home for Christmas, when we are surrounded by home at Christmas, it's not just something that we buy, it's something that is made. It's something that is prepared. We know that in part it was made just for us. And so when we dig into that pie or we eat the peppermint bark or we scoop a a spoonful of chili to make the medicine go down, right? It is, that should have been what the song was, by the way. We know that there was someone in the kitchen who had love in their heart for us and was waiting for us, was anticipating us. So I don't know what your meal is, or I don't know what feels like home, what tastes like home. Uh, Sometimes we get that experience here. When I was an associate at Stonebridge United Methodist Church over in McKinney, um, we um, heard from the congregation uh, a few things that th- we would like to be more biblical. We wanted to do things by the book. We wanted to do things as the Bible said. So we thought, great. And so we had a group of people that said, well, Passover is taken with unleavened bread. And so we decided, well, for the Eucharist, for Holy Communion, when we all come together at the Lord's table and we dine in the the Feast of the Lord, we're going to do it like the Bible says, like they did in Bible times. And so we're going to serve unleavened bread. And so people came and they got their little flaky bread and and we broke it for them and we handed it to them and they kind of loosely dipped it in the cup because it doesn't soak very well and they ate it. and, And we did it like the Bible does it. Until... All of those people who wanted to do things exactly like the Bible says to do it missed out on the sweetness of King's Hawaiian bread. Right? 
that there's only so much we want to do it like the Bible says it until it becomes really uncomfortable and doesn't taste as good, right? Because home had been for so many Methodists, for whatever reason, Welch's grape juice and King's Hawaiian bread. That's what tastes like home. See, even in an environment where we are not blood-related, at least not by biological blood, we get to taste home when they experience the sweetness of the King's Hawaiian bread with the sweetness of the Welch's grape juice. Or sometimes it is homemade bread. When we come to the table of the Lord, we know that at least in part, that body and that blood was given just for us. And we get to sit with our brothers and sisters, our family in Christ, and we get to experience home and rest and comfort and love and joy and peace in this home that we have here. It really is an interesting question. What was Joseph looking forward to that made him feel like home? Did Mary, had Mary already experienced some of the traditions of the Carpenter family? I'm using Carpenter as his last name there. What were they looking forward to? Because here's the narrative, right? Allison kind of spelled it out a little bit. The narrative that we have heard from there's no room in the inn is that Mary and Joseph were kind of the same way that we talk about Jesus. We talk about them as outcasts. We talk about them as having to flee from Herod and the, this birth narrative being this huge risky business, which in some part that's what tradition has told us, and that's true. But what does it mean for us in terms of what home feels like, what church feels like, what faith looks like? What does it mean for us when our narrative from the beginning is that of being radically independent and just making it in the world? When the story is, is that, you know, in, in, um, in, in the Mexican tradition, they, they send kids from house to house and, and they act out the story of them being turned away from the Hyatt and the Hilton and the Holiday Inn and the Marriott. And, and eventually they find this rinky-dink cave. And think of every movie you've ever seen about the nativity story. Where, where do they end up? It's in the far back corner of Bethlehem, away from everybody, in the freezing cold, in an open area stable, where everything is dark and miserable and disgusting. And the narrative that we love as independent kind of Western people is that these are heroes who make their own home that they can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. They don't need dark chocolate peppermint bark, and they don't need pot roast and roast beef cooked by somebody else to make them feel at home. They can do it themselves. And this is the story that we take out of there was no room in the inn, so they had to give birth in the stable. But, but let me ask you to put on your, your imagination caps for a little bit. As people who believe that the table of the Lord in communion is open to all people, because at least in part, Christ died for everyone. That everyone is welcome into the life of Christ. Let me ask you to put on your imagination caps a little bit. And let, let's think about this story of Mary and Joseph from a, a purely biblical perspective. And I say biblical perspective in that you have to dive into the words of the Bible. Because the, the words Luke uses. Luke doesn't give us a whole lot of details about what chocolate cake Joseph was waiting for or anything. But... He gives us very specific words of there was no room in the inn, so they had to go to the stable and give birth in a manger. And again, we picture the inn as the Hyatt or the Hilton or the Holiday Inn, um, but Bethlehem was a pretty small town. Archaeologically speaking, Bethlehem was too small of a town for there to actually be a hotel the way that we would think of as a hotel. In fact, Luke does use a word for hotel. Luke chapter 10 in uh, the Good Samaritan, uh, Luke uses this word pentakion. And pentakion is the word of which he dropped the wounded traveler off at a hotel where there was somebody who would tend to their wounds while he paid for a room to stay in which is what we normally think of as a hotel, a pantacheon. This is the room that would have existed in Jerusalem, perhaps, as so many people came for the Passover feasts and the Pentecost feasts and every other feast that they held around the temple. They would have paid for a room to stay, a pantacheon, so that they could be nurtured and taken care of, have a home for a night, at least, or a home for a week while they celebrated. But that's not the word in, or not the word translated as in. 
In fact, even if you, if you read the New International Version, uh, if, if you read the New International Version, it uses, there was no guest room available. I was with some other people who say, let me, let me take you to a first century Bethlehem ha- house. This is, this is what the village would have most likely looked like. They weren't single family units like we see all over McKinney and Fairview and Allen. Um, they were built in villages to conserve resources and provide security and protection. Usually the, the doors entered into the outside into a courtyard. Um, and, and they were all kind of shared walls with each other. And then if you look at what the actual house looked like, it was normally, you know, they were lucky. They had two stories. They were, they were luxurious. Um, but, but the second story was raised for issues of flooding, issues of security. And the second floor was where they did all of their living, their eating, their sleeping. It was all in one place. To, to give you a, kind of a floor plan, this is what it looked like. So you've got the family room, you've got the cooking, eating, and the sleeping, and then downstairs you've got this place where there are animals there. And animals have a feeding trough, which is sometimes called a manger. The word Paul uses for uh, in in this is Cataluna. And the only other time that Cataluna is used in Luke is in chapter 22, verse 11, and it's when the Last Supper is being set up, they go to the place and say, where is the Cataluna that we may feast tonight? And I, and I don't really believe that anyone thinks that Jesus and his disciples went to the Holiday Inn and said, we'd like to use your ballroom for the night to feast in. So this feels like home. Popular scholarly opinion is that it might have been the home of Nebuchadnezzar or some other kind of underground, wealthy, pharisaical type who did believe Jesus was the Messiah. And so they would have gone to, what's it called? The upper room, the Cataluna, which also translates as dining room. So they could have felt like home in that Last Supper. There was no room in the Cataluna. There was no room in the upper floor where they slept, probably because everybody is coming back to Bethlehem and there's no hotel to stay in. Does it change the narrative at all? To think that Mary and Joseph weren't independent, straggling wanderers who had to fight for their lives. But that they actually were welcome home. That they, yes, had to stay with the animals. And there was a manger with hay that was provided there. or That, that was there, and, and it seems rudimentary. But does it change anything to know that Mary gave birth where she could smell dinner being made for her recovery? Does it change anything to know that that the sisters-in-law were upstairs praying and singing over her as she gave birth to the Savior of the world? Does it change anything about the narrative of our faith to know that, that Mary and Joseph, Jesus, weren't rugged individualistic outcasts, but that the very meal that Jesus instituted might have, might have found roots in the birth story that he was a part of. That when we provide an open table of welcoming, when we provide a church of welcoming and inclusion and acceptance, when we try and, and, and have something that tastes like home, it feels like home, that it might have been anchored in what Jesus had known all along. Right? The manger is not ideal. It's not a Baylor Frisco with steak and lobster after you give birth with wood-plated walls and sort of mattresses on your birthing bed. But they made it work for them. When Mary and Joseph got there and there was already too many people there, or perhaps they were following Levitical laws, they didn't want to touch a woman who had just given birth because they would be unclean afterward. When they got there and they knew that she was, in Allison's words, about to pop, which I've never found a woman who enjoyed that sentence. Right? When, when they get there and Mary is pregnant, we don't know how long they were actually there, but during that time, she had to give birth. And it wasn't like they were just rugged out on their own, perhaps. It was that they had a community, a family, that said, you know what, here, let us take care of you. We have found a manger that you can use as a crib. We have the most comfortable place or the place that we can make most comfortable for you. Does it change anything at all? 
to not think of this story as people left out in the cold, but to think that they might have found their church. They might have found their home. Not in the cold, dark stable at the outskirts of town, but in the stable that was a warm, welcoming environment that their family was blessing them with. As we take communion today, or even as we are a living body of Christ, one of the ways we want to welcome people home is by providing that same sense of security to wandering travelers who have had to go a great distance. And not necessarily your friends and family who come from out of town, but one of the things I have seen Creek would be a blessing for, or one of the groups of people I have seen Creek would be a blessing for, is those who have gone so far away from church, who have been burned by church in the past, or have found church to not be a place where people will set up a manger for them and cook dark chocolate peppermint fudge or pot roast or apple pie just because they like it. Their experience of church has been a lot more strict or darker or not as graceful. It's been one in which they have been kicked out in the past. And it's been really wonderful to see us as a body of Christ be a, a place that says, you know what, we will find a manger for you. We want you to be reborn again. We want you to experience the tastes of home that are present in the love of Jesus Christ, in the body and the blood of Christ that we inhabit after we take communion. It's been a wonderful place, not only as Carrie Lynn said last week, where we know the names of each other and can call each other by our names and what we mean by those, but where we will find you a manger. We will not make you circle all of Lucas or all of Allen to find a place to stay. We will not make you find some place in the deep, dark corners of the world to belong, but we will open up our hearts and open up our minds to welcome you home because that is what happens in the manger. That's what happens in Joseph's home. That's what I believe happens as Mary and Joseph possibly do look forward to a welcoming, loving home. And I would love for people to still find it here. I believe that they do find it here. And I believe all of us get that taste of home when we do come forward for communion. Whether we're at home with our bag provided by Pay Staff and Frito Boyd and Nancy Greer and their team of taking communion out into the world so that people recognize the grace of God and feel a taste of home in their home. Or whether we've come to this house to be a family together to taste and see that the Lord is good. My prayer for us as we take communion is that when you do experience the sweetness of King's Hawaiian bread, what Jesus probably actually meant by unleavened bread, when you experience that sweetness, you feel like you're at home. And what I want you to do from that experience, because... Anybody who, who took a best friend home at college? Maybe when you got you know, serious about dating, you took your girlfriend, your boyfriend home. And the entire way there, there's the anticipation of you have got to try my mom's pecan pie. Right? You will not believe the mac and cheese that my aunt makes. You will not believe the steak and the lobster. Who has steak and lobster? But, if, you know, that my, that my dad, my grandpa makes. Right? And you're telling this person the entire time how much fun they're going to have and how enjoyable it's going to have, how it's going to feel like home. And if you've ever been the person who's going to your future in-law's house or your best friend's parent's house, it can be nerve-wracking because you don't feel like you're at home. You don't have your traditions and your food and your peppermint bark. But you've heard how good it can be. So here's what I want. It is when you take communion today, when, when you experience the sweetness of what home tastes like, I want you to have someone on your mind that you're going to invite next week to church to worship with you virtually, whether you set up a Facebook watch party or you just comment along with them in the feed or whether you invite them to sit in your row with you, provided you're safe uh, about it next week. We, I want you to have someone in your mind that you're going to invite to taste and see that the Lord is good next week.
Because I do believe the world needs a home. And I believe that that home is found in the manger in Bethlehem. I believe that we can be the people upstairs who do not turn people away, but instead find some place for them to rest. So have that person in mind so that they too can experience the sweetness of the love of God. So Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. So therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. You'll find the words of the, great, of the, of the prayer of confession on the screen, wherever you are. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. Who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send empty away. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I would invite you to have your communion uh, elements ready as we take them together. If you're at home, we invite you to take some time to, to either serve yourself or serve each other by uh, breaking of the, the solid or the bread and dipping it in the cup that you have here. We will do it together. We will say this is the body of Christ. 
uh, broken for you, and then this is the cup of Christ given for you. You can choose to try and dip them in, or you can eat them individually, but this is the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you. Amen. Once again, remind you to register your attendance with that QR code here or online uh, with the comments, uh, the link in the comments. Just a few things going on for the Advent Christmas season. One, if you adopted someone from the ACO Angel Tree, uh, as Carrie Lynn mentioned, those drop-offs are uh, December 7th through 10th on the live nativity. You can bring it down to the church building here, which will only be open for that one specific uh, usage. So uh, you can bring them on those nights as well. And the next announcement we have is about live nativity, which is one of my favorite things um, in the Advent season. It is this Wednesday and Thursday. You're welcome to invite your community, your friends. We're going to keep it distanced with chairs and uh, hay bales up by the, outside the barn, not inside the barn this year. Um, so it'll be a different experience, but also kind of a more of a 3D experience uh, as well. So come be a part of that. If you can serve as a parking lot greeter or a greeter um, to help hand out candles or cookies or anything, there's going to be a link in the, um, the sign-up, or you can, uh, you can just come see Carrie Lynn here in person um, and sign up for that. We still need a few more for those. And then um, next Sunday is Pajama Sunday, um, which, if you don't know the history of this, I'm not going to go into it now, but this is our sixth Pajama Sunday that all started by an accident on my third, so well, not really an accident, but a bad decision on my third Sunday here. Um, it turned out to be fantastic. So you are welcome to wear your pajamas to church. It's an annual tradition here that we do uh, at Creekwood. You're welcome to wear your pajamas at church. If you're worshiping virtually, please post your pictures, even though it's been Pajama Sunday for nine months for you now um, with the pandemic. So it's just part of something we do here for fun. I'll, we'll be in our pajamas. Just have fun with it. 
And then uh, Christmas Eve schedule, please go to creekwoodumc.org slash Christmas Eve. Um, but I just want to highlight, um, we're having a reduced amount of Christmas Eve services. Two of them will be outside. Uh, one o'clock will be family oriented. Three o'clock will be a contemporary service. The traditional service will be inside at seven, um, as well as uh, both services will stream online, contemporary at five and traditional at seven. And I just want to highlight, I know, even though I know we're running late, um, Carols Around the Pond is going to be um, there are going to be members of our choir. Bill Busby is going to play guitar for us. And we are going to hold our lights on December 20th at 6.30 um, around the pond um, and just have a carol sing with some scriptures read. And I think that when we see the lights dazzling off the pond, then it'll just be a really neat experience that we'll be able to do, especially if you're someone who wants to be outside and distance during this time. So uh, join us for any and all of those. We'd love to celebrate the risen Christ with you and now receive this benediction. No that our story of faith is not one of isolation. Our story of faith is not one of independence, wandering. Our story of faith means that there is someone who is upstairs preparing a meal for you. There is someone waiting to welcome you home. And if no other human in this world, then the person of Jesus is that person for you, who is ready and waiting and has been working for you this entire time. You are loved and you are welcomed home. May you go out into the world to welcome home those who need to know what it means to love God, love your neighbor, and love ourselves. Amen. I'm so glad you joined us for worship this morning, and I would love to hear from you. If you have any questions, you can find my email on our website, creekwoodumc.org. As we are undergoing this Advent season, preparing for the birth of Christ into our lives once more, there are so many opportunities to learn and share and serve together as we seek to be a light in the world. We hope you have a merry Advent season and a merry Christmas, leading toward a happy new year.